Good afternoon and welcome. I am Pat Parazzini, Director of Alumni Engagement, Regional Chapter Development for Fairfield University, and I am so thrilled to be able to bring this presentation to you via Zoom. In my position here at the university, I have the pleasure of working with alumni from across the country, coordinating with chapter leaders and volunteers to host events that keep alumni connected to and engaged with Fairfield. We have nine regional chapters from Boston and Washington, D.C. alphabetically, and from Boston to San Francisco geographically. So I hope to meet you all in person at an event in your local area in the very near future. Before I introduce our esteemed guest presenter, I would like to go over the format of the lecture today. It is a PowerPoint slide presentation and our guest lecturer will be speaking to those slides. We'll have a break midway and at the end for questions. Please type your questions via the chat function on the Zoom and I will relay them to our guest. And please make sure your video and audio capabilities are turned on. Today, I have the great honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Kurt Schlichting. Dr. Schlichting, Fairfield University, is the E. Gerald Corrigan 63 Chair in Humanities and Social Sciences Emeritus. At Fairfield, Dr. Schlichting served as the Dean and Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and as a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Waterfront Manhattan from Henry Hudson to the High Line 2018 is his third book for Johns Hopkins University Press. Grand Central Terminal 2002 won the Association of American Publishers Award for Best Professional Scholarly Book in Architecture and Urbanism. Grand Central was the basis for the 2008 PBS American Experience Grand Central, an award-winning documentary. Dr. Schlichting was the academic advisor and appeared on screen. His academic research is at the cutting edge of the field of Historic Geographical Information System, HGIS, which he used to study the Irish in New York and Newport, Rhode Island. In the spring of 2017, he was a visiting fellow at the Moore Research Institute, National University, Ireland, Galway. Currently, he is co-director of the NYH GIS, New York Historic GIS, centered at the New York Public Library and is an advisor to the Library's Center for Digital Humanities. He remains active at Fairfield University, serving as co-principal investigator for the Center for Social Action's major project to conduct a needs assessment for the United Way of Greenwich, Connecticut. Kurt and I have partnered three times on events for the New York City Alumni Chapter, two tours of Grand Central Station, and one of the New York City Waterfront, and these events are always sold out. I give you all Dr. Kurt Schlichting. So, uh, listen, it's great to see you here, everyone, to be together virtually. I've done these Grand Central tours for, for many years, and a little shameless, shameless self-promotion on the right-hand side, you see the Grand Central book, and I followed that up with uh, Grand Central's engineer in 2011, and my most recent effort is uh, Waterfront Manhattan, from Henry Hudson to the High Line, which does include the railroads. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to think about Grand Central. Of course, this is the Grand Concourse. And it's, it's the most visited space, interior space in the city. And the clock in the middle of Grand Central is a place where you can meet. All you have to do is see you at the clock in Grand Central. And everyone knows, anyone who knows the city knows, uh, the, the clock in the center of the Grand Concourse. But what I wanted to do today is I wanted to place this in the context of the Vanderbilt family. Uh, people are familiar with the Vanderbilt family. It's, uh, it's a name that reverberates down in history. And it begins with Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he, um, he built an empire before he got into the railroad business. So for example, you can see that before that, he was born in Staten Island. He came from a, a farming family. They weren't wealthy at all. And when he was about 17 years old, he borrowed some money from his mother and bought a small sailboat. Uh, it was called a periauger. It was a, a Dutch design, a flat bottom boat. And Vanderbilt began to offer service 
back and forth between Staten Island and Lower Manhattan Island, the tip of Manhattan Island. And he, he prospered in that. He was involved in the early steamboats in New York Harbor, the steamboat empire, and he builds an empire. He runs steamboats up to Albany, New York. The passage between New York and Albany was incredibly uh, vibrant because the Erie Canal ended in Albany and people wanted then to get to New York City. And he traded up and down with the, the cities along the, the Hudson River. He organized a, a steamboat service between Manhattan Island the, on the East River, between Manhattan Island and Long Island Sound to Greenwich, Bridgeport, New Haven, and all the way up to Stonington, Connecticut, which you may know is at the very end. It's the last town in, in, in Connecticut before you enter Rhode Island. But from there, he organized a, a railroad line, or an, a, there was a railroad line that would take you to Providence and then on to Boston. And it was much quicker than sailing to Boston from New York Harbor. You had to go around Cape Cod. So he organized that. And then during the civil, during the, during the, not the Civil War, during the gold rush, people are desperate to get to California. Well, you could go by a wagon train across the country, or you could sail around Cape Horn. And that would take months. Four months was not unusual. Five months to get around from New York by a sailing ship around the worst w w water in the, in the world, Cape Horn, and then up the coast of South, uh, South America, and then up to California. So what Vanderbilt does is he organizes a steamship service between New York and Nicaragua, the coast of Nicaragua. On the, um, on the Caribbean side. And then you could take a boat up a river to Lake Nicaragua and then travel across Lake Nicaragua where there first would be a, a horse-drawn carriages waiting and then later on a small railroad line down to the Pacific coast of Nicaragua and ships would be waiting and they would be steamships as well to take you to uh, San Francisco and the gold and the gold fields. He uh, was married to his first wife, uh, Sophia, for a number of years. He had 13 children, 10 girls and three boys. And the three boys are listed uh, on the right-hand side, William Henry. He'll inherit most of the Commodore's wealth. He had a son, Cornelius, who wasn't very successful, uh, was a ne'er-do-well, uh, who actually committed suicide in 1882. And he had a son, George, who just um, had an ordinary life and, and wasn't part, really part of the Vanderbilt Empire. Well, then, it's now during the Civil War, 1863, and Vanderbilt gets into the railroad business. He's 69 years old. Well, he really didn't build railroads. He took over railroads that others had pioneered. So, for example, he gained control of the New York and Harlem, the Hudson River Railroad, and then the New York Central. Now, the Hudson River, the New York and Harlem, started as a horse-drawn train, train service between the city of New York, which was down at um, the, the, the very end of Manhattan Island, and the village of Harlem. It was a village up the up on the island. There was farmland in the middle of, of Manhattan Island. And then people went to Harlem, wealthy people in New York went to Harlem, especially in the summertime, to escape the heat and especially to escape the communicable diseases, which would often break out in, um, in lower Manhattan Island. The Hudson River Railroad was organized by a group of investors in Poughkeepsie, New York, who wanted to have rail service from Poughkeepsie to New York, to the tip of New York, uh, Manhattan Island. And they did that. And then finally, the New York Central, there's, it's a saga, they built a railroad parallel to the Erie Canal, linking 
Albany with Buffalo. Now you might wonder, well, why did they build a railroad when they had the Erie Canal? Well, the canal froze in the wintertime. And by the way, so did the Hudson River. It was eight separate railroads at one point, and I think there were two more added for a total of 10. And then finally, they were put together and they formed the New York Central Railroad, one railroad company. Well, Vanderbilt takes control of that as well. And in 1869, he goes up to, he has his people go up to Albany, New York with a carpet bag, with carpet bags filled with money. And he gets the, the state legislature in New York to pass a bill to form the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. And he combines those three railroads and it's the New York Central. So for example, today, when you go to Grand Central and you ride on the Harlem River, the Harlem division, you're riding on basically the tracks of the New York and Harlem, which eventually went up to, up to Harlem, then crossed over into the Bronx, then went up into Westchester County, and they went all the way up uh, to close to Albany, New York, that no longer have trains that far. And then when you ride the Hudson Division along the Hudson River, you're riding in the, on the tracks where the Hudson River Railroad was originally organized. And the Hudson River Railroad and the Harlem had an enormous advantage. They had train service to Manhattan Island. The Hudson River Railroad went all the way down the shoreline of the Hudson River, all the way down almost to City Hall. And they could service the piers along the Hudson River. And it was an enormous advantage. The other railroads, the large railroads, all had to come to New York, but no one of them, no one else, no other railroad could gain access to Manhattan Island. And that was an enormous advantage the New York Central had for many, many, many years. Well, the three, the, the, grant, the uh, railroads, the two railroads that are now the New York Central, they also needed a place to have a, a, a terminal that combined the service to all, to both of them and to the New Haven Railroad, which they had uh, signed an agreement with uh, for 401 years that gave the New Haven the right to run its trains on the tracks of the New York and Harlem down into Midtown Manhattan. Well, the passenger service just grows and grows, especially with the, ad, with the addition of the New York Central Railroad. And they needed a terminal. And they, the railroad owned land at 42nd Street and Vanderbilt Avenue that the New York and Harlem used to use to store its trains and to service its trains. And Vanderbilt decides that's going to be the place he's going to have his consolidated terminal, his passenger terminal. And when, when he announces plans for this first Grand Central, there's enormous outcry. What are you talking about? 42nd Street, New York is, 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 is not above Houston Street. So you'd have to take a, a, uh, a, a horse car, and you can see the trolleys in, the, on the, on the, in front of the terminal. You'd have to get on a trolley down in lower Manhattan Island and ride that trolley up to 42nd Street, or if you were wealthy, your private carriage would take you up to 42nd Street. And this is the first Grand Central. And behind it was a very large train yard that was open at ground level and it was prosperous. The, the, the railroads were the only way to travel. It was the only way you could get to the Midwest was to go by train. There were obviously no airlines. So the railroads really did rule supreme. And this was a very, very elaborate terminal building that uh, Vanderbilt had constructed at 42nd Street. And you can see Vanderbilt Avenue that Vanderbilt Place, just to the left of the, of the first Grand Central. And also, it creates this dynasty, the dynasty of the 
Vanderbilt family. There's a good biography of, of, uh, of, of Cornelius Vanderbilt called The First Tycoon by E.J. Stiles, which is very, very good. But he basically builds the greatest fortune in the world. So when Vanderbilt dies in um, 1893, 1877, I'm sorry, he had the largest fortune in the world by many estimates. So what does he do? Well, he leaves the bulk of his fortune to his one son, his eldest son, William Henry. Now, he leaves money to some of the daughters, but what they do is they go into court and they sue <laughs> because they wanted more money. And that lawsuit, a contested will, drags on in the press, in, in, in the courts for over a year. And uh, Vanderbilt's reputation is dragged through the mud by, by the sisters and their attorneys. It was a, 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 a food fight. Now, William Henry inherits this giant fortune, which would be estimated about five or almost six billion dollars in 2020. And he has six children. He has four sons and two daughters. And the third generation are going to be the generation that build the new Grand Well, Grand Central, the first Grand Central, helps pull the, pull the city of New York farther up the island. And the railroad is very, very successful. Passenger, the number of passengers passing through the first Grand Central increases year after year after year. And that particular building is not working. So that in the, eight, in the early 1890s, they commissioned, the railroad commissioned, a rebuild of that first Grand Central. And that's Grand Central too. And you can see that on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of that. It, um, and you can see, by the way, you can see that the area around Grand Central has grown and they added uh, two stories over the original story and a half and they made the uh, the building more more accommodating but the problem was they only had 13 tracks and it was the the, the volume of traffic third could, passenger traffic couldn't be accommodated but those 13 um those 13 tracks so what they did is they announced an architectural competition and in the next slide, we'll, we'll see William Wilgus. He was the chief engineer. And he announces, uh, they, the railroad, the New York Central Railroad, announces an architectural competition in 1903 for the new building. But they were going to not only build a new Grand Central, they were going to put the underground train yard, I'm, I'm sorry, they're going to put the train yard underground, and you'll see that in a moment. And they invite major architects, the major architects in the country to submit plans. And uh, among those who submitted plans were Daniel Burnham, who had designed the Chicago's World's, World's Fair, uh, Stanford White from the famous McKim, Mead and White. They submitted plans. And Carrier and Hastings, who were a partnership, they had designed the New York Public Library. They had won that competition. So this was the major architects, American architects of the time, submitting plans and participating in the architectural competition. Well, lo and behold, the firm of Reed and Stem of Minneapolis wins the competition. Now they were a major, they were a, a firm that had designed a number of terminals for the grand, for the New York Central system but much smaller in scale. And they had nowhere near the reputation of Daniel Burnham or a Stanford White or a Carrier and Hastings, but they won the initial competition. Well, it turns out that uh, William Wilgus, who we'll meet in just a moment, was married to uh, Stem's sister. <laughs> so they win the competition.
Reed is uh, Reed's sister is married to William Wilgus. And really, he's the hero of uh, of the Grand Central story from my perspective. He was born in Buffalo, New York, as you can see. He went to high school, didn't go to college. But to be an engineer at this particular period of time, there were only a few places that you could study engineering. One was the, the, uh, the Naval Academy. The second was at West Point. And the third was at Cornell University. So that he goes to work for the railroad, as you can see, in 1893. And he has a meteoric, meteor, meteoric career at the New York Central. And by 1901, he's the chief engineer. Now, what he does in 1903 <laughs> is to put together a plan for a new Grand Central. And in a six-page memo to the president of the railroad and to the board of directors, where the two Vanderbilt third generation, they were there, and so was J.P. Morgan. So it was a very distinguished board of, of multimillionaires. And I simply said that it's, it's, I'm not the first to say this, but a multifunctional plan of staggering genius. It really is, a, is, a, is an unbelievably complicated plan. Look, what they're gonna do is the train yard is up at ground level. They're gonna put that underground. They're gonna build a two-story underground train yard. And of course, you can't use steam to run that particular underground train yard because what are you gonna do with the steam? So they have to electrify. Well, that sounds easy to our ears, but at the time, no one had built large electric trains. They had trolleys and they run by electricity with a 25 horsepower engine. Well, you're gonna need three or 4,000 horsepower engines to pull the big heavy trains in and out of Grand Central. Well, once they've put the train yard underground, then Wilgus argues that they've created air rights, the space above this underground train yard, and they can build then a large, large real estate development in midtown Manhattan, which Wilgus calls Terminal City. And the revenue from Terminal City is going to pay for the entire Grand Central project, which was going to be millions and millions of dollars in 1903 dollars. Well, getting back to the competition. So this is the plan that won the initial competition. It's not the Grand Central that we see today. It's certainly a, 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 a huge building fronting on 42nd Street. And the idea is that it would have 12 stories of revenue producing space. And that would pay for the Grand Central project. And the New Haven Railroad was a partner in this because they're part of, they, could, they ran their trains to 42nd Street as well. And they were in favor of the Reed and Stem plan. And Wilgus makes the rental income is part of the financing of this new Grand Central. Well, enter Whitney Warren, Whitney Warren. Whitney Warren was an architect who's going to play a major role in the Grand Central project. <laughs> and in Wilgus Auto, in his unpublished autobiography, he writes, in the latter part of 1903, Warren and Wetmore proposed themselves in connection with the Grand Central design. He also writes, he said, there was a knock on his door and Whitney Warren comes in and says, well, I'm going to be part of the design of the new terminal. Well, who's Whitney Warren? Well, he was born in Troy, New York and lived in New York City. His father was a lawyer and financier. For those of you who know Newport on Narragansett Avenue, was the, they had a summer home 
He was a member of Mrs. Astor's 400, you know, the height of the, uh, the height of the social world in New York City. And then what he does is his father sends him to the Echo de Beaux-Arts, which is, uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. It was a, uh, an architectural school in Paris. And he's socially prominent. There's a large uh, story about him when he marries his, his wife. And he attends fancy dress balls that the Vanderbilts give. He goes sailing or yachting on Cornelius William K. Vanderbilt's yacht. So he's socially prominent and certainly well-connected. And this is the Echo de Beaux-Arts. So that in this era, era, after the Civil War, from 1865 to 1950, 1915, it's called the Age of Energy. Uh, the United States comes to become the leading industrial country in the world. New York is the preeminent city in the United States. And there's a search for an architectural style. And what emerges out of this is what we call the Beaux Arts. And the school was located on the right bank, left bank in Paris. You can see this, the, the picture on the right is not a, is a modern picture. The buildings are still there. It's not an architectural school now, it's, it's an art school. But in that, those windows that you can see on the second floor are where the library is. And I went there to look at uh, Whitney Warren's school records when he was at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And it really was designed as a place to teach architects to build for the French monarchy and the French aristocrats. So it was monumental style. But what you didn't do is you didn't go and just sit in a series of lectures as you would at, a, at, a, at, at an American university, for example. What you did is you studied in a studio and Whitney Warren joined the, the they're called Atelier's of Dumont and Giralt. And then the, the curriculum was organized around the series of architectural competitions. So the architects would go down to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. They'd go into the library building. And what they do is they give a line of architectural project, a major project to design a library, to build a, a palace. And they had to sit down and from scratch, they had 12 hours to do some early sketching and to outline the project. And then that would be judged. And if you pass that first hurdle, you then would return for, to your studio for about two months and you'd work up a complete design. And then you'd return to the Echo de Beaux-Arts, you'd return to the Beaux-Arts building, and then someone would be judged as a first prize or a series of second and third prizes. Now, Paris at the time was a major, major destination. It was the city of lights. And it was bohemian and romantic to be on the left bank. A famous American architect, Louis Sullivan, said it was the damnedest pigsty I ever got into. But Warren spent a decade there. And he came back well to, to an America that was looking for an architectural style. And others that went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, other Americans who went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts came back trained as these architects in a monumental, at a monumental scale. And the most important one is Richard Morris Hunt. He was the first American to study at the Ecole. He returns he has a fabulous career. He builds the facade, the Fifth Avenue facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, he designs some of the white city buildings. And then in Newport, Rhode Island, as you can see, he is the 
court architect. He's the court architect for the Astors, the Vanderbilts, the Golettes, and he just has a, a fabulous career here in, in Newport, Rhode Island. And here's a perfect example of the Bow Arts. This is the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street. It's an imperial facade. This is classical Greek and Roman architecture. It's grandeur on a monumental sky, sky, on a monumental scale. And critics labeled it the, in, the imperial facade, but it's perfect for the Gilded Age. It's perfect for New York City, which wants to be not just this country's major city, but one of the major cities in the world. So you have projects like the New York Public Library, the Fifth Avenue facade of the Metropolitan Museum. You build the, the, the architects of the Rhode Island State House. And in the middle, the middle picture here is the White City to celebrate the anniversary of Columbus coming to the Americas. And they built down on the water in, in Chicago, they built this white city. The buildings were built out of plaster, but they were a major tourist attraction when, while the, uh, in 1893, when, this, uh, when the celebration opened. And you can see that on the right-hand side, you have the Paris Exposition, which is Beaux Arts. And in a sense that that influences the white city. And then in Newport, Rhode Island, here's the two mansions of the Vanderbilt third generation, the third generation, William K. And if you've been to Paris and you, you go out to Versailles and you walk through the, the Hall of Mirrors, you can see what William K. wanted and what Richard Morris Hunt was capable of doing. And the Gilded Age, the Gilded Age continued. The, uh, the Vanderbilts, William Kay, also had a mansion on Fifth Avenue and 52nd Street. You can see the fancy Gilded Age social life that Whitney Warren was involved in. So he knew the Vanderbilts socially. He went to their parties. He was, he was really part of the Gilded Age in New York City. And of course, the other, the other brother, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, he had William Morris Hunt design the breakers, which was built and opened in 1895. Now, here's part of the story of Whitney Warren. We're back to Whitney Warren. Uh, in Newport, there's the Newport Country Club, founded in 1893, and they decide to build a clubhouse a year later and they form a syndicate. These are the members who are socially prominent and they're gonna decide uh, on, they're gonna organize an architectural competition for the design of the clubhouse. And you can see William Kay is there, Cornelius II is there, and the brother Frederick Vanderbilt is also on this committee to choose the architect. Well, they go out to, um, out in Newport, they go out to Ocean Drive and they buy a piece of land and that's where they're gonna build the country club and Warren wins the design. He wins the design and that's celebrated. And you can see it's a beautiful building overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. And it's, um, so this is his first major project when he gets back from the Echo de Beaux Arts gets back from Paris. And then the New York Yacht Club. Well, first of all, in 1898, uh, Warren and Wet Whitney Warren has a partner, Charles Wetmore, who's a, a wealthy lawyer. Well, the New York Yacht Club was founded in 1844, and they needed a new clubhouse from the first clubhouse on Madison Avenue. 
And JP Morgan owns some property on West 44th Street, so we donated that to the Yacht Club. And they announced an architectural composition. There were 11 submissions, and Warren wins. He wins in 1899. By the way, Warren had, had submitted a plan for the New York Public Library, but didn't win that, that architectural composition. Cornelius Vanderbilt, William K. Vanderbilt were, were members of the New York Yacht Club. And I think they influenced the choice of Whitney Warren to design the club. But on the other hand, Warren, Warren was a really fabulous architect and he understood the Beaux-Arts style. You have a central space, and I'm gonna point that out in Grand Central in a moment. And for the New York Yacht Club, you walk in the front door, there's a stairway that takes you up to a landing. You turn to your left and you go up into the model room. And the, the building was designed around the central space. Down the street at the New York Public Library, the central space is the reading room on the third floor. And the stairs bring you up to that space. That's a principle of the Beaux Arts. Well, what Whitney Warren does is he takes, he completely abandons a plan for a revenue building over the 42nd Street's facade. And what he does is he designs this classical Beaux Arts building, the building that we see today. Now, what the New York Central did was they forced Reed and Stem to join with Warren and Wetmore in Associated Architects. And that was something that was forced on, on Reed and Stem. They had no choice if they wanted to still be involved in designing the uh, two-story underground train yard, for example. And William K. Vanderbilt played a key role in this. And he demanded a monumental Beaux Arts building. He convinced J.P. Morgan what they wanted was a statement about their railroad and to some degree to, the, to themselves. This is the Vanderbilts. And so they're gonna not only design Grand Central, they're gonna build Terminal City. And that's a perfect Beaux Arts project. You're gonna build this monumental building and you're gonna build up Park Avenue over the underground train yard. And the, the New York Central Railroad could do this because they were in control of that particular part of Midtown Manhattan. Midtown Manhattan wasn't a center of the city's commerce by any stretch of the imagination when this project begins. In fact, if you went over to where the UN is now, there were slaughterhouses. There was no refrigeration. You had to, you had to slaughter pigs and you had to slaughter cattle in order to have fresh meat. And then they just dumped it into the East River. And here's looking down Park Avenue. This is New York's Grand Boulevard, just like the Grand Boulevards in Paris. You, and it's anchored by the new, what was the New York Central Building, which was designed by Whitney Warren. And then the buildings that you see Coming up Park Avenue, uh, I'm sorry, coming up Park Avenue are buildings that were thematic. They were Beaux Arts. They were to create this view down to Grand Central Terminal. And it extended from 42nd Street to 51st Street, including the Waldorf Astoria and then the, the church that's next to this was a, a huge project. And remember, going back here, the train tracks that were on 42nd Street are now underground. The terminal, the train, the, the terminal itself is now underground. And we, and so this, this deck is built over Park Avenue and it creates this terminal city. And it really is a Beaux-Arts masterpiece, the whole design for the building. 
you have the central space is the grand concourse. All of the, the uh, corridors come off the grand concourse and it included three hotels, the Roosevelt Hotel, the Commodore Hotel, and the Biltmore Hotel. And all of this is integrated. That was the Reed and Stem plan. And that part of the plan was carried out. And then you have the facade and the facade is this Beaux Arts masterpiece. Well, it proceeds along and then the, uh, the grand opening is on February 1st, 1913. And this is a beautiful picture of the Grand Concourse just the night before Grand Central was going to open. But getting back to William Wilgus, Wilgus isn't part of this. He leaves the railroad in 1907, and he's not part of the ceremonies opening this magnificent building in the heart of Midtown Manhattan. Well, by 1913, the railroads really did rule supreme. You've got to remember there were, there were very few, there were some commercial, there was some commercial airline service, but if you wanted to get anywhere as a passenger, you needed to ride these glamorous trains of the New York Central if you wanted to get to Chicago, you wanted to ride the 20th Century Limited. So it really was a time when the railroads were supreme. There was no interstate highway. If you wanted to ship anything across the country, you needed, you needed the railroads. So I think uh, we'll stop here and, and, and take a brief break. Kurt, I do um, have a few questions. Okay. All righty. Um, so first one, how much control did Cornelius Vanderbilt's grandsons have over uh, the plans for the new Grand Central Station moving forward from 1903? Uh, they, they really were, in, they were completely influential. In, in the particular part of it is to, is to replace the Reed and Stem building <laughs> with the Grand Central that we see today. That was the key part where they had a great deal of influence and they insisted that Whitney Warren participate in that project, that part of the project. Okay, okay. Um, and I have a question, um, because I remember from uh, the tours we did at Grand Central Station, whatever happened to Wilgus and why did he leave New York City in 1907? Well, it's a complicated story. The electrification is taking place and the first new electric engines from General Electric are pulling the trains back and forth into the old Grand Central. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in uh, February 1907, a train leaves Grand Central, goes up through the Bronx, it's, it's late at night, it's going fast, it goes off the tracks in the Bronx, and 21 people are killed. And it threatens the entire Grand Central project, because the politicians say they're going to indict the two Vanderbilt third generation brothers, they're going to indict them for manslaughter. They're going to pass legislation that says you can't use electric engines on Manhattan Island. Well, everybody starts blaming everyone else inside the railroad, and Wilgus gets caught up in that, and basically he resigns. And I found in his papers at the New York Public Library a, <clears throat> a brochure for the opening day and um, he writes, it's in his pen, pen, he's written on with a pen, my name is not included. And it wasn't included. But he went on to a very, very successful uh, career as an engineer. And, um, but that's why he left the railroad. Okay. But was he involved in the opening ceremonies in 1913? He was not. He was not. Okay. He was not included in the opening ceremonies uh, in 1913. Okay. He was forgotten. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Linda and Tom. Who was Campbell and what is the background of oh, the Campbell apartment? You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Grand Central, around Grand Central. It was a space 
that they really didn't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. So a wealthy businessman, Campbell, um, used it as his office and it became known as the Campbell apartment. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, Pat, I'll just, I'm going to stop my share here. All righty. And I'm going to um, get my next module. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to start that show. And then, uh, Pat, uh, I first of all then have to share my screen. I'm going to open this. Well, we, uh, we left it at, at the railroads tri triumphant, and that was true. And you can see some data there from 1910. But major, major change is about, about to happen, and that's, that's the highways. And the highways cometh. And you can see in, in 1931, uh, the city of New York, the Port Authority, builds the George Washington Bridge. And in the foreground is the tracks of the New York Central Railroad. Now, by the way, the New York Central Railroad had to pay property tax on that property that they owned where they had their train tracks. They had to do that everywhere their, their tracks went. We build the highways at public expense in the sense that we, the, the Port Authority uses the tolls for the people driving over the bridge to build the George Washington Bridge and then the highway, the highways take over. And what we do is we regulate the railroads. That's a story that deep, it probably needs another session, but there's great animosity toward the railroads as being all powerful. And so in 1906, we set up the ICC, the Inter Interstate Commerce Commission, and we regulate the railroads. And prices for what the railroads operate go up, but they don't allow much of, a, of an increase. And then the, the, really it's the automobile age. And in 1900, there's only 8,000 automobiles in the United States. And then we build the interstate highway system. And the railroads can't compete. They can't compete with that publicly subsidized mode of transportation. And in the, in, in the New York metropolitan region, the, the electrification of Grand Central wasn't for just the terminal itself. We built, the, Grant, the railroad built what are called the electric zones. And this allowed, it, allowed people to commute. So you could become a commuter. And the Long Island Railroad did the same thing out in Long Island. And that then allows for people to suburbanize, to leave the city. And perfect example of that is Levittown. And the people who, the, the, especially the veterans of, of the Second World War who could afford to move to Levittown uh, thought they had died and gone to heaven. Even these are very modest homes, but it was much better than a crowded apartment uh, in the Lower East Side. Well, what happens then is the city goes into a downward spiral. Uh, it's the death of the New York Central. It can't, in the Depression, it doesn't have a dividend. Uh, it's the automobile and the, and the truck age after World War II. And the railroads go bankrupt, basically. And in fact, the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad, who were great rivals for a long, long period of time, they merged together along, basically organized by the Congress of the United States, and they formed the Penn Central Transportation Company. And then Penn Central goes bankrupt in 1970. And all of us who remember going to Grand Central Station at this period of time, it was falling apart. The, the, the railroads had no money to maintain that structure. And it's the near death of New York. 
Uh, Jimmy Carter goes to the South Bronx that looks like Berlin at the end of the Second World War. And all of us who knew New York at that period of time, you went to the East Village and the tenements were abandoned and the street people took over, the squatters took over, West Side Highway is falling apart, it had to be closed. And then the city is ready to go bankrupt. And that's that famous headline, uh, Ford to the city drop dead. And then there's the destruction. Pennsylvania Station was the rival of Grand Central. It was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad. They built a tunnel under the Hudson River, then a tunnel over to Long, Long Island to build a, 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 a terminal building that was as magnificent as Grand Central. And not only did the city have Grand Central, it also had Pennsylvania Station. It was a Beaux Arts masterpiece. And it was torn down. In 1963, they begin the demolition of, of Penn Station. And now, as Vincent Scully, a famous architectural historian from Yale said, one entered the city like a god, one scuttles in now like a rat. And any of us who, or all, any of you who use Penn Station or even go to Penn Station occasionally, it's awful. It's really awful to be there. Scully was right. Well, the New York Central is bankrupt. And what does it decide to do? It decides to demolish a building behind Grand Central that was a baggage building and a parcel building. And then to sell that to a developer in 1962, that developer builds the largest office building in the world. And it overshadows Grand Central doesn't. It does it to this day. You go to Grand Central and down Park Avenue, you can see how it overshadows everything else. And by the way, if you look at this particular picture on the right-hand side of looking down Park Avenue, the original Beaux Arts buildings, with one exception, have been replaced by a series of glass-walled buildings, including the, the, the famous um, Sigrams building. Well, Grand Central's at risk. Not only does the, what, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the railroad says, well, look, if we've already allowed the Pan Am building to be built, well, we have space over Grand Central, air rights over Grand Central, and we can build another office building. And there were a series of proposals. On the far left, you can see one that's directly over Grand Central. You can't see the, the, you can't see the terminal any longer. Well, that was scaled back, and the railroad decided to go to the most, one of the most prominent modern architects of the time, Marcel Brewer, and he had a particular design that the railroad said, yes, let's do this. If we, if, we've, if, we've built the, if we built the Pan Am building, let's build this other building. Well, there's a real reaction here. And it's the public to the rescue. And it's led by Jackie Kennedy, and you can see Mayor Koch there on the right-hand side. But the city in 1965 passes the Landmarks Preservation Law, and Grand Central is designated as a landmark. It has landmark status. In fact, it's the second building in the city that is designated a landmark. Well, this enormous court battle un unfolds. The Penn Central goes to court and says, listen, this is a taking of our property without compensation. You can, you can designate this as a, as a landmark, but we want the equivalent of the revenue we would have received from our building. Well, this goes through, you know, it's in the Supreme, it's, goes, it's in the courts for a decade. And finally, in, in 1978, the Supreme Court upholds the Landmarks Preservation Law. But that doesn't solve the problem. The Penn Central now is bankrupt. The deterioration of Grand Central has continued. The roof leaks. Street people are living in, in, in the tunnels down under Grand Central. It's a nightmare to go there. So they organize a rescue. 
Well, first of all, you first of all nationalize what's left of passenger railroads, the passenger railroads, that's Amtrak. Then in the New York metropolitan region, you set up, the, the Congress sets up Conrail. Then later, New York State and Connecticut both charter the Metro North commute, computer, commuter railroad, and the MTA says, we're going to rebuild. They hire a, a number of firms. The most important one is Bayer Bender Bell, and Bayer Bender Bell comes back and says, this is going to cost 90 to $100 million to save the building. Then they bring in as consultants, LaSalle Partners, and they had renovated Union Station in Washington, D.C., and turned it into a destination. And that saves Union Station, and that's what they're going to do at 42nd Street. They're going to restore, and they're going to make Grand Central um, not just a place to go to catch Metro North, but to go, go and celebrate. So they start to restructure. They start to renovate. And they have to rebuild the mechanical structure. This is what we don't see. I was down in front of that rotary converter there on the left-hand side, which converts um, direct current to alternating current, or I'm sorry, alternating current to direct current. And, and I was with a group of um, engineers from, from Metro North, and they said, you know, we were trying to run these things when we first came here. And he said, you know, we couldn't call General Electric that was built by General Electric and order a part. We had to go to a machine shop and have them fabricate the part. So it was very expensive. They clean the exterior. They restore the, the famous Zeus and, and Hercules uh, statutes that are affixed to the front of the, the building. They rebuild the lower concourse. They, they, have a, they, they go to court and argue that the building is a private building. It can be closed at night. That gets them, the, and, the, and they work with the city to have the street people who were sleeping in the building removed. They restore the Vanderbilt room. They restore, and of course, they restore the Grand Concourse. And that took a year to do or two years to do, I'm sorry, two years to do. And many of you might remember going to the Grand Central then, and they're doing the restoration. And notice the, the bottom picture, they're cleaning the, the Zodiac, the famous ceiling of Grand Central, which was covered in soot. And it turns out it was nicotine from the millions of people who went through Grand Central every day and people at the time smoked incessantly and they had to just clean that off. And they restored it. So we can go and we can see this. And many of you know that on the west side uh, facade up on the, uh, up on the ceiling, they left one patch of the ceiling not cleaned to remind us of how, how bad it was. Well, it was, it really was a rebirth. It's a place to go, uh, fancy restaurants, um, places to have a drink. The Campbell apartment is a very, very expensive place to uh, stop in and, and have a libation. But it works because all of that high-end retail, that revenue pays for the bonds that the MTA and had to float to get the money to do the restoration. So it has worked and every year, the high-end retail produces more than enough revenue to pay those bonds back. So it was a success. And this is New York's really main plaza. It's certainly the, the plaza for the, for the uh, midtown Manhattan. You know, if you're going to New York and you want to meet someone, you say, I'll meet you at the clock. That's, by the way, where Pat and I always start our, our, our tours of Grand Central. We, we just meet at the clock. Everybody knows where that is. Well, there's a rededication in 1980-98. Uh, Jackie Kennedy has, was dead by that particular time. And John Kennedy there on the right, um, and Governor Pataki, and then the president of the railroad and president of the MTA are there to celebrate the rededication of, of the restoration. 
and Grand Central celebrated its uh, 100th anniversary on February 1st, 2013. I was involved in that, and I'll just tell one quick story. Uh, I got in touch with the American Association of Architects. I'm sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> the American Association of Mechanical Engineers. And they were going to dedicate a plaque. And I talked with the, uh, the, the president in, in D.C. and then the New York president, and everyone was on the same page. And they said, no, we need a plaque to recognize Wilgus's contribution. And that plaque was installed on February 1st, 2013. Well, the, uh, the impact of Grand Central on New York and Midtown Manhattan never ends. And many of you, some of you may know, they're bringing the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central. And you can see in these schematics, they've dug down 90 feet through the rock below the lower level and used tunnel boring machines to bore out these tunnels under Park Avenue that you can see on the bottom left. And those tunnels will bring Long Island, an estimated 150,000 passengers a day on the Long Island from the Long Island Railroad to Midtown Manhattan. Now, they needed a new terminal space for this particular addition to Grand Central. So this is gonna to it's, it's cost, by the way, $10 billion to do this. The tunnels have been bored. Uh, I've been down there, I've seen them. It's fabulous. Well, what did they do? Well, a developer had bought the block next to Grand Central on 42nd Street. And they go to the city, they go to um, Bloomberg, the Bloomberg administration and say, we'll donate $100 million to this project to build this access to the Long Island Railroad on Vanderbilt Place. Uh, however, we wanna build the highest building in Midtown Manhattan. And the city of New York said yes. So that's how uh, they got the project done, and they're well, well on schedule now. But here's my, uh, our last picture of Grand Central, and most of us are not ever up on the, the roadway that goes around Grand Central, but, you know, there's a statue there. It's, it's there. It's below Hercules. And, and who's it? Well, it's the Commodore. <laughs> it's Commodore Vanderbilt. His, this, this by the statute was on the, a building they owned along, the, along um, the west side of Manhattan, way downtown near City Hall, St. John's Park, where they had a, um, a freight building. And they saved that and they placed it um, on a pedestal for overlooking um, Park Avenue. So I'm, I'm going to end here. And uh, I hope you enjoyed our, uh, our online tour of Grand Central. We got to talk about the Beaux Arts, which um, hopefully you can understand better now. And um, I, I thank all of you. Uh, Kurt, I do actually have a couple of questions. Okay, um, Pat. If you, don't, if you don't mind. Not um, at all. Um, someone asked, where is the plaque um, to Wilgus located in Grand Central? It's located across from where you um, where you, you can buy Metro North tickets. It's, um, I think it's, I should know this, shouldn't I? I think it's 44, track 44. Okay. And you can see the plaque there. I do, rem I do remember, I'm picturing, because when you and I did the tour with the New York uh, alumni chapter, I, I can picture that as well. Um, and Nina also asked another question back to the Campbell apartment. Um, she had heard that it was used as a holding pen jail. Is that true? I don't, I've heard, you know, there's a lot of myths about Grand Central. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that. It, it possibly okay. is. Um, there's also, by the way, people don't, most people don't know this, that in, in, in the very front facade of Grand Central, there's space up above where the statutes are. There's space up there right. that includes a, a, an indoor uh, tennis facility. By the way, up there as well is a giant office space where they run the railroad from. I do remember you telling us that yeah, as well. So, yeah. yeah, so there's, that's where they run the railroad from. Yeah.
Well, um, Kurt, as always, <laughs> it is such an honor to partner with you on these events. Um, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time, your talents, and your expertise with all of us. Um, I want to thank those who attended our tour today. Um, and just to let you know, we will be continuing to provide lifelong learning experiences being Zoom. Um, our next is Thursday, April 30th at 4, when we will take a visual journey of 19th century America through the art of Winslow Homer with Professor Philip Elizoff. Um, do visit fairfield.edu backslash alumni events, and you can see everything that's um, going on with these online experiences throughout the university. Again, I thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you again. And until then, be well and stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah, take care. Take care.